you're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. In this podcast, we're going to talk about what Mike Lindell's been up to lately. Televangelist Nathan French prophesying a year ago that God would punish Twitter for kicking Trump off their platform. Pastor Tommy McMurtry's problem with feminism and gay people. We also take voicemails. If you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. If you want to send an email instead, the email address is telltalemailbag at gmail.com. I'm streaming on Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube simultaneously, all three, because YouTube gave me a content strike. I got COVID in the beginning of January, or Kylie got COVID, actually, and in response, I created like five videos, and I uploaded them all just in case I got sick I would have like a month's worth of content to release. In one of those videos, I was addressing John MacArthur and his claim that um, his COVID claims, and I was debunking them. And I guess YouTube picked up on that and only heard the part where he said the things that he said and completely ignored the context around it where I was debunking it and gave me a content strike for COVID misinformation. If I get three of those, then they delete my channel. And I already had one, so it made me really nervous to say the least. And I decided that YouTube no longer has exclusive access to me. Up to this point, people had to come to YouTube to see me, to listen to my videos and to interact with me and all that stuff. YouTube no longer has exclusive access. I realize they can pull the rug out from under me any second and just completely destroy my life. So I'm not going to continue to give them exclusive access when I can't fucking trust them. I appealed the content strike, and they immediately rejected it. That means I can't upload for a week. That's one of the repercussions. I can't upload, I can't post to my community tab or anything at all for a week. I already had content uploaded and ready to release for a while, so I'm fine. I'm not going to miss any videos. But the fact that they banned me from uploading but not from releasing kind of tells me that the whole point here, the whole goal that they had in the first place is to prevent me from talking shit about them, not to prevent me from like releasing something they wouldn't like or whatever. So long story short, I'm not dealing with YouTube anymore for that reason. That being said, the content strike was on my main channel, not my podcast channel. So I don't have to worry about not being able to live stream or anything like I normally do every single week because it was on my main channel and I don't really live stream on that anyways. I live stream on my podcast channel. In the future, you should be able to find me live streaming on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook every single week. I may cut one of those out. I may not. I'm not sure yet. We'll see. In fact, I may upload exclusive content to one of them. I don't know. Maybe I'll start playing games on Twitch or something. Who fucking knows? But that's the situation right now. Um, Subscribe to my Twitch or follow. I think it's follow on different platforms. I don't know. Just follow me on Twitch. Follow me on Facebook and follow me on YouTube. I would greatly appreciate it so that I don't have to worry about YouTube pulling the rug out from under me. And completely fucking my life. Zada Hugla, we need more people on Twitch or no monetization. Don't sweat it. It's okay. We'll get there. We'll get there. I play the long game. If you guys do want to get to Twitch, feel free. But don't feel like you're obligated to. Um, I have 44 viewers currently. 217 views. 110 followers. We'll get there. It's no big deal. Always play the long game when it comes to social media. Affiliate is literally easy. Partner is a right, proper bitch, though. Well, I, you know, I'm already monetized on YouTube, so maybe it won't be terribly difficult for me. I'm not sure. I guess time will tell. I would like to work with Twitch. I think Twitch is an okay place to be. You can just fill it, fill it in with some games. I could do that. I could. I could definitely do that. And hell, maybe I'll make it entertaining. I'm playing Final Fantasy VIII right now. Maybe I'll restart Final Fantasy VII on Twitch, that could be cool. Or play Breath of the Wild, maybe? That that could be cool, too. And just stream for like an hour or two one day. 
be entertaining, right? All that jazz, YouTube be like, and strike, and strike, and strike, and strike. Strike, and strike, and strike, and strike, and strike. I hope not, because exactly four is how many it takes to delete my channel, so I hope they don't. <laughs> they did say, and strike, and strike, though. And then they said, okay, we reversed the first one, but the second one still stands. Thank you guys so much for the support tonight. That's absolutely fucking amazing. And so many viewers... 1,500, that's a lot more than usual. That's pretty fucking cool. Not to mention the 70 viewers on Twitch. That is the shit. I really appreciate all the support, guys, for real. Absolutely amazing. I don't know what's up with Facebook, but fuck Facebook, you know? <laughs> As most people say. I am going to upload there, but I don't think I'm going to st live stream there, probably. Hey, this is Owen. If you're comfortable, leave your first name and state at the sound of the tiny truck backing up. Hey Owen, I got one for you for your new rate uh, for, for for your radar. Her name is Kelly Shabaka. She's running for senator in Alaska. She speaks in tongues and she sounds like a fucking dolphin during mating season doing it. It's just wee beep 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 beep. Funnier than shit. You gotta listen to her. Take care. Love your show last night, and I will call you soon about the um, walking on water shit. I'm just trying to put it together that makes sense for you. Bye. Yeah, I appreciate the phone call. This guy actually calls in a lot, which is pretty cool. I appreciate that he calls in a lot. That's awesome. If you guys want to call in, you can call at 1 800 701. Wait a minute. Let me just double check. Yeah, the number is 1-800-701-8573. And the email address is telltalemailbag at gmail.com. So send me a message if you're interested. Um, the reason that I hear from this guy so often, I, I don't always play stuff from him on the podcast or whatever, but the reason that I hear his voicemails is because he leaves a lot of voicemails that are under 30 seconds, and those are the first ones I check. I have like 100 voicemails right now, and I go through them and find the ones that are under 30 seconds. I listen to all of those. If I don't have enough for the podcast yet, then I go up to voicemails that are shorter than 45 seconds. After that, I go to voicemails that are shorter than a minute. And by that point, I already have enough voicemails, almost always, to air on the show. So if you want to guarantee that I'm going to listen to your voicemail, whether it's something you want to air on the podcast or not, keep it under 30 seconds and there's a virtual guarantee I'm going to hear what you have to say. That includes any raiders that came in and raided my chats earlier. If you have a message you want me to hear desperately... That's a good way to get my attention. Send, send me a voicemail or an email or something like that. It's available to you. You don't have to spam the chats. You can just send me a voicemail or an email. That's simple. About the voicemail itself, he mentioned a congresswoman named Kelly Chibaka, I believe. This is her name up here, Kelly T-S-H-I-B-A-K-A. -A. Now, what's unique about this woman is the fact that she is... Lisa Murkowski's opponent, I believe. She's an Alaskan congressman, one of the few Republicans who voted to impeach Trump. And uh, he swore to basically unseat her when her time came up. Well, time's up, and Trump is holding to his promise by endorsing an opponent candidate to her. And the opponent that he's endorsing is Kelly Shibaka. So I wanted to actually talk about the video that the voicemail caller was mentioning. And then we're going to read a short article about this woman, just so you get an idea of who she is. In the video, she's talking about her daughter, I believe. She has a, a very young daughter, and she's talking about what happened when she was little. Me for years and years until Denali started talking. And then we would have these full conversations at 18 months. So what we just heard here is her imitating the conversations that she had with her kid when they were 18 months old. But it wasn't just baby talk. In a minute, you'll hear her explain that this is what she believed to be actual speech that her daughter was using. And for the record, speaking in tongues is actually a skill that can be learned. It's actually pretty difficult to do naturally, like riding a bike. It's something that you don't normally forget. If you're interested, talk to the YouTuber Prophet of Zod about it. He actually can speak in tongues and did so. He did a demonstration of it at Faithless Forum this past year. It was really, really interesting to listen to, but... 
Anyways, it's a skill. It's not something you can just go out there and do. Usually, most people can't. Let's continue listening to Kelly Shibaka describe what her daughter was doing. And I knew exactly what she was saying. I said, oh, yeah? Well, what's that like? I was just going back and watching videos of it. She would tell me, even to this day, I cannot understand what she's saying. But me in the video will translate exactly what she said, an interpretation. And I would, con I would converse right back with her, and then she'd go back and say something. So she didn't believe that her daughter was just using baby talk. She seems to believe that her daughter was using real language, like actual words that nobody could understand except for Kelly Shibaka. And then other people would come in the room, and she would have this full conversation with them. And they'd go, and she'd look at them, like they were so stupid. And she'd look at me like, will you please interpret for me? And so I'd tell them what she said, an interpretation of the tongue, and then they would talk right back. And that's when I realized God loves it when I try to talk in my spirit language. He thinks it's so cute that the only person in the world who can understand me is him. My God, this is cringy as shit. I'm having trouble expressing how incredibly odd this person is. I really, really deeply hope they don't make their way into Congress as Trump hopes that she will. So anyway, thank you for the voicemail. I really appreciate that. Thanks for drawing my attention to Kelly Shibaka. She is the opponent of Lisa Murkowski in Alaska. Let's hope she doesn't make her way to Congress. I just want to ask this question about why Christians from here in the U.S. don't always seem to care about Christians in any other country. Like, there have been times when they've been treated badly in other countries, but mostly here in the U.S., we usually just talk about me, me, me. There are a lot of Christians in other countries that are genuinely persecuted. Seriously, genuinely persecuted. A lot of Middle Eastern countries have small Christian minority populations, and they are mistreated terribly there, which makes it even more sad when Christians in the U.S., Christian nationalists, Christian extremists, pretend to be persecuted when their brethren in other countries genuinely are. All you have to do, Jeremy, to get to incur a lot more persecution is buy two airplanes. <laughs> I feel like it speaks to the narcissism involved, not necessarily clinical narcissism, but the, the self-centeredness involved here with all of these televangelists especially. I think the televangelists like Kenneth Copeland and Hank Kuhneman and others are really the ones that are driving discourse in the Christian community right now for the most part. And every time they make their congregants feel like they're persecuted, they take that home and spread it around to everybody in their lives. When these televangelists spread that persecution complex narrative to their congregation, it popularizes the idea in wider society. And it's a complete embarrassment, especially when there really are people out there, really are Christians out there, genuinely being persecuted right now, today, in other countries. It is an embarrassment. Hi, good morning. Um, I was dealing with, with a, a group, actually, if you want to look it up, it's called the World Mission Society Church of God. And... Um, one of the things that they mentioned about Jehovah's Witnesses is that they, um, they, at, during Passover, they, they pass around, um, they, you know, that they just pass around the bread without eating it or something like that. I, I wanted to know if that's true or if I should write that off as another, um, as another, you know, lie that they've, that they've told me. But, um, yeah, just for reference, this group places a lot of, um, emphasis on the Passover and, um, beliefs that you get like eternal uh, life from it but um yeah if you if you can just uh, you know verify that and, and answer that have a good day bye-bye yeah thank you so much for the voicemail that is an interesting question let me back up a little bit and listen to specifics of the claim that they make and i'll address those specifics one of the things that they mentioned about jehovah's witnesses is that they um they at, during passover they they pass around um 
you know, that they just pass around the bread without eating it or something like that. I... That's half right. Most people know that Jehovah's Witnesses have this thing with the 144,000, right? Most people know that they believe 144,000 people are going to be going to heaven, and everyone else who is a loyal, believing, door-knocking, baptized Jehovah's Witness will remain here on earth to live in a paradise, basically Garden of Eden 2.0. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses do pass the bread around and the wine to everybody, and every single member of the church, in fact, everybody in the church, in the kingdom hall, is expected to touch the plate and the glass of wine. But only the 144,000 that are going to heaven are allowed to eat it and drink the wine, and they are expected to do so. The question a lot of people ask when they hear that is, how do they know that they're one of the 144,000? And the answer is, they just know. They have to be super devout, super deeply believing, basically never sinned a day in their life, pretty much. They're just expected to know. They come out and they say, I believe I'm one of the anointed, and then they're kind of vetted and questioned about it and all that other stuff. If there is any doubt in their minds, then they're not anointed. That's the claim. Anointed, of course, meaning one of the 144,000. So the 144,000 do eat the bread and drink the wine. The normal members of the church just pass it along. That was half right. It sounds like they were trying to dog on Jehovah's Witnesses to some degree, but not quite getting it right. I guess they got the fundamentals correct. Next, we're going to talk about what Mike Lindell's been up to lately. Give us 30 seconds, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. First story I wanted to talk about is about Mike Lindell. I've talked about him a few times before, and I'm sure if you watch the news at all, you already know exactly who this guy is. But let me give you a little bit of a refresher. He runs the company My Pillow. He produces pillows and sleepwear, towels, all you know, all that stuff. Really, really close personal friends with Donald Trump, apparently, weirdly. And he is a Donald Trump true believer, full-blown Donald Trump cult member. He was carrying water for the Donald Trump election claims like a while back, and you'd think after the election ended and Biden got inaugurated, all that would stop, right? No, it continued. He continued uh, to this fucking day, to this day, to claim that Donald Trump really won the election and that we're going to find this out in the next, like, three weeks Keep setting dates like a fucking televangelist. It's bizarre. So I want to give you guys a little bit of a reintroduction to who Mike Lindell is. Re refresh your memory. This is a video from mid-September 2021 that we're going to watch. And then I want to watch some more recent ones because, believe it or not, the dude is still doing this shit. Like, last week he said some crazy shit. So let's watch this clip from mid-September 2021. And we'll move on to the newer ones. Oh, and by the way, I don't think I mentioned, this is an appearance he made on the Jim Baker program. Of course, Jim Baker being that televangelist who spent time in prison for defrauding a bunch of people. Now remember, the biggest thing is every state, every single state, was this was a cyber, a cyber attack of historical proportion. Donald Trump won 80 million to around 68 million, okay? I assume he means 68 to 80 million, but that's absolutely preposterous. Donald Trump did not get that many votes. I forget how many Biden got exactly. Let's see. Okay, over 159 million people voted in the U.S. general election in 2020. Biden won 81.2 million votes, or 51.3% total. There were 159 million Americans voting in the 2020 election, and Trump won 74.2 million votes. So those are the final numbers. This guy is saying that Trump got 80 million. Are you saying that Biden took some of Trump's votes and counted them for himself? Are you saying that people just dropped the votes off of Trump's count completely? How did this work exactly? 
Well, don't worry. The dude is going to tell us exactly how he thinks this worked. Let's keep listening. Here's the four miracles that I see. The night of the election, the algorithms that were set with the mm -hmm. 2010 census is what they used. Uh, by 11 o'clock at night... I just want to point something out. The word algorithm is used entirely too often. Usually when people are using the word algorithm, what they meant to say was artificial intelligence or data set or something like that. It's like the word blockchain. People use that way too fucking often. Usually when people say blockchain, it means absolutely nothing. That or quantum. Quantum's another word people use way too often and don't know what it means. But I digress. Let's go back to it. When they realized, when the machines realized, and they realized Donald Trump was going to win anyway because of everybody voting for him, they did not expect this. I mean, that was, a lo that was the Lord there. This is all God's timing, by the way. Now, you look at when that happened, they had to stop everything in the middle of the night, and then we've seen all these deviations that didn't make sense. This is another claim he made. There were not deviations in the middle of the night. They were adding counts to each candidate's totals, but there was never a point in time when votes were added to Biden, but not to Donald Trump. That did not happen. That was fake news. I mean, real fake news, not Trump fake news. It was actually bullshit. That never happened at any point in time. Trump likes to reference these big ballot dumps that happen in the middle of the night. People were adding counts. I mean, they, people were continuing to count the votes. That's true. But there's never a point in time where Biden got a massive amount of votes that Trump didn't also get some votes added to his count. That didn't happen. 100,000 votes in Michigan mm -hmm. uh, that drop in for Biden. Now, let's talk about that. What did they tell us? They said, well, those mail-in votes, by golly, you know, those they vote for Democrats, you know, or whatever. Well, those mail-in votes were counted on the morning of the 3rd, not, the, not in the middle of the night on the 4th. Yeah. You know, you can explain all these things, but one of the things that... That's just nonsense. What he's saying here is just complete nonsense. He's desperately trying to find a reason why Trump won when he simply did not. I'm sorry, Mike. That just didn't happen. Explain all these things, but one of the things that happened was you had all these non-residents that voted in every state. In every single state had all these non-residents that voted. How would that even work? I moved to New York City and I'm not registered to vote here yet. You have to register to vote in your city. You can't just register in West Virginia and then vote in New York City. It does not work like that. You have to go down there and show them proof of who you are and sign up and put your signature down on a piece of paper and get a card saying that you're a registered voter in the district and all that other shit. It does not work that way. What is he even talking about? Has he ever voted a day in his life? Does he know this process? He should. I'm sure he's voted. He knows what registering to vote is like. It's kind of a pain in the ass in some areas. So that begs the question, is he just propagandizing for the sake of it? He knows the process of registering to vote. He knows it. I'm sure, without a shadow of a doubt, he's voted before. So why is he lying about the process now? Well, they, you didn't have that many people go out and commit a crime. That was an anomaly in history that nobody looked at. I looked at it right away going, this has to be done by computers, and they're just using their names. They were. They were using the 2010 census, so those people no longer lived in that state. Now he's saying that the systems that counted the votes are the same ones that did the 2010 census. That's an interesting idea, except for the fact that the census database and the voter database are different. They don't include the same people. As a matter of fact, a lot of people from the 2010 census may not even live in the U.S. anymore. They may, they're not even registered voters for that matter. They didn't find any evidence of unregistered voters voting. I will tell you, however, they did find evidence in a few circumstances of voters voting multiple times for Donald Trump. They found a few examples of that across different states, which doesn't really come as a surprise. Trump specifically asked p his voter base to do that. 600,000 people could vote by absentee in this state. Yeah, are, you, are you confident in that system? Well, I, they'll go out and they'll vote, and they're going to have to go and check their vote by going to the poll and voting that way, because uh, if it, if it uh, tabulates, then they won't be able to do that. So let them send it in and let them go vote. And if their system's as good as they say it is, then obviously they won't be able to vote. 
If it isn't tabulated, they'll be able to vote. So that's the way it is. So that's really not surprising to anybody to find that kind of result when the candidate specifically requests his voters do that, which, by the way, is against the law. Dead people. We all heard about dead people voting. Dead people didn't vote, and nobody sat down and used it and wrote their name. They was pulled from the voter rolls from the 2010 census. Okay, the voter rolls and the 2010 census are completely different databases, and I don't know this for sure, but I have to guess that Dominion Systems, as he's saying here, weren't being used to count the 2010 census. All of this is nonsense from beginning to end. So why am I even bothering to debunk it? I ask myself that question on a regular basis. The reason is because he's had more strange shit to say and he's facing consequences for it now. This clip came out mid-January 2022, so it's fairly recent. Listen to this. Everything you're going to see over these next seven months to get rid of the machines, you're going to see the Supreme Court case coming out, all these great things, everybody. Oh, my God, dude. He is still so obsessed with the idea that there's some impending sense of justice. Trump is going to be reinstated. I can't tell you how many claims this dude made over the past year. I mean, seriously, this happened in November, what, November... Fourth, I think, is when the election took place. This guy's been saying the same exact shit since November 4th, 2020. We are now in 2022, and he's still saying this shit. I don't know how many claims he made, how many dates he set throughout 2021, but it was a lot. And he still, to this day, seems to be making claims that there's some impending sense of justice, something is about to happen, we're right around the corner, and Trump's going to be reinstated to this day. Let's keep listening. By the way, you can find more at frankspeech.com. I'll put that little out, put that out there. Yeah, uh, I thought about cutting that out, his little self-promo, but I decided not to. Why would I? Frankspeech.com is a failing social media network, and I think that's absolutely hilarious. It is one of the best things that could possibly happen to society for frankspeech.com to fail miserably. I absolutely love it. Let's keep listening. There are so many. I'm more optimistic today than I have been yesterday, the day before that. It, I'm on an incline like this. Why? Because it's so amazing. All the things that we have, we already have all the pieces of the puzzle. And you talk about evidence. We had enough evidence to put everybody in prison for life, 300 and some million people. I'm sorry, what what was that? 300-something million people? There's evidence to put 300 million people in prison. I'm sure that you guys have probably heard this before, but there are only like 330 million people in the United States. There were only 159 million voters in the previous election. How did he come to the bizarre conclusion that there are enough people in the U.S. even, to put in prison for voter fraud, for election fraud. How could he possibly have come to that conclusion? It is nonsense from beginning to end, and I am here for it. Uh, we, we had that all the way back to November, December. But what we have are these other things that had to happen, which was all evil revealing itself. I mean, evil's popping up like pocket gophers. I mean, they pop their heads up, it's whack-a-mole, right? I mean, it, it's everywhere. And that all had to be revealed so that we can fix it. Wow, that's fucking strange. Here's his explanation for why nothing is being done, why nothing is being solved. It's because... We had to let the evil reveal itself so that we can take care of it. That is so beyond fucking ridiculous, I don't even know what to say about it. He's not just going out there and saying bizarre shit, though. That's not his only role right now. He is also sponsoring anybody with a microphone who's willing to say what he wants said. He's paying them hundreds, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars to come out here and say all kinds of strange shit. Whatever, uh, anybody who's willing to say it, he'll give them money to do so. Lance Wall now actually came out with this clip mid-January 2022. This is an interesting one. In case you're unfamiliar, Lance Wall now is a Christian nationalist, an extremist to the core, a hardcore Trump believer. Listen to this clip from Lance Wallna on his show. Oh, but uh, there was no violence at Biden's inauguration because nobody was there. 
We want to point out nobody was there because it wasn't an open inauguration. The virus was ravaging the country at that moment, and it was an intelligent decision for Biden to have a closed, televised inauguration rather than a public one. Not to mention the fact that Trump extremists were waiting in the wings to do something crazy. But none of those facts matter, ultimately, to this guy. All that matters is spreading the propaganda. But the they thought that Trump was giving signals to his militias. These people live in paranoid land. They're not sane like us. They're not rational like us, like us and Mike Lindell. Why does he have a cardboard cutout of Mike Lindell at his house holding a pillow? That's fucking weird, isn't it? They're not sane like us. They're not rational like us as he approaches a cardboard cutout of Mike Lindell. What the fuck is going on right now? I'm not even going to get into the time that he prayed over a cardboard cutout of Donald Trump. Take the smell of smoke, the disappointment, the bitterness, the anger, the feeling of betrayal and loss. That It must be a terrible thing, Lord, to, 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 to actually feel as though you've been stolen an election. Why does he have these cardboard cutouts at his house? This is so fucking weird. But, you know, I'm getting off topic here. The point is, Mike Lindell is sponsoring anybody with a microphone who's willing to say what he once said. Let's listen to the, uh, the message here. By the way, I've ordered a lot of Mike Lindell slippers and a lot of Mike Lindell bathrobes and a lot of Mike Lindell towels for Christmas. I figured the supply chain coming from China was disrupted, but Mike Lindell wouldn't let me down. Guess what? I'm still waiting, Mike. I love you. My pillow. Use the code Lance. You can get 50 to 60 percent off. I'm wearing Mike's slippers as I speak. I love Mike Lindell. He's one of the more rational parts of our army. Is that the word you use to describe him? But uh, the supply chain, Mike, let's get it sorted out, buddy. I put over a thousand dollars in Christmas presents there and I'm still waiting. So anyways, yeah, Mike Lindell. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's spreading conspiracies all over. And you know what those conspiracies lead to? They lead to this. Please, President Trump. Please, please, I hope you have a plan. God, please save us. Save us from the devil, please. I'm sorry, this is not funny. This is sad. This is really sad. Um, <laughs> this is sad, actually. This is complete disconnection from reality at this point. Please, President Trump, I hope you have a plan. Save us from the devil. There is no part of this woman left in reality anymore, and this is the direct result of people like Mike Lindell and the conspiracies that he spreads, and less specifically, Donald Trump. I mean, a lot of these things came from Trump originally. It actually is very sad, really. Here's another conspiracy that is the direct result of Mike Lindell. This took place at a conference called Reawaken America. It's the Reawaken America tour. They've been going around the country holding these events, getting these big speakers like Mike Lindell, for example. This guy on the right here uh, with the white shirt, he's part of a social media thing called The Good Liars, I think. And in a minute, you'll see his buddy on the left here. He is also part of the Good Liars. So these guys go to like QAnon events and stuff and they ask them questions and just pretty much get them to admit the crazy things that they believe. Listen to them talking to this woman, this real woman, at a real QAnon conference hosted by, or at least attended by, Mike Lindell. I don't know what level of involvement Lindell has. I don't know if he's paying for part of it. I don't know if he's one of the hosts or what, but he's definitely there and he's definitely a speaker. And he's spreading the message that this conference endorses and stands for. Listen to this. Yeah, I shoot food for a living all around the world. Did you know that the, the Nazis were living on Mars? Yep. That is actually a QAnon belief, so I'm not really surprised to hear them say that. And she seems a little bit, like, nervous about acknowledging it. I think that that's because that belief is one of them that they kind of keep under wraps for the most part, QAnon. They don't, like, parade that one around. It's mostly just in private forums that you find them talking about that. And he just came out and said it, and she's, like, kind of nervous about it, you know? 
Really, I did. Yeah. Okay, because I just heard that oh, right now. I'm telling you, yeah. The more you know, the more you know. Wait. No, oh, she's trying to escape, but he doesn't want to let her. So, so how long? Have, how long have you known this? See, my mind is a little bit blown right now. Maybe a year. It's more people living off planet than underground than on the more people living off planet and underground than on top. That's another core belief of QAnon, the idea that there are military bases that live underground. And, you know, I'm sure the military has bases underground. I have no doubt with satellites all over the place. I'm sure they're taking pictures of every square inch of the planet. I mean, I was just looking at pictures of Russian bases taken by satellites. And I realized at that moment that most bases probably are underground because nothing is hidden from the surface of the planet at this point. If you want to hide something from an opposing military, it has to be underground. But it goes beyond that with QAnon. It's n it doesn't just stop there. They're saying that there are full-blown breakaway civilizations that have no further contact with above-ground society, basically. They live underground, they work underground, they survive underground, they have children down there, and they don't talk to people on the surface. And they are like a thousand years more advanced technologically than the people on the surface of the planet. It gets fucking strange, some of the belief systems that they have. So she's kind of mixing in some of the more well-known belief systems by mentioning underground here. There are more people living off planet and underground than on the top. Not really surprising at all to hear her say that. Right. I want to tell my family about this, but I'm afraid they're going to say I'm fucking crazy. They will. They'll commit you. They say, you can't be saying that stuff. You're ruining Thanksgiving right. dinner. What I try and tell myself is it's not crazy if it's true. But we're not crazy, right? That's actually a really common talking point. It's not crazy if it's true. In fact, I think a week or two ago, I read a comment I got or a message I got from my SoundCloud, which is who hosts my podcast. Some dude got on SoundCloud, sent me a DM. Obviously a deep Trump supporter, like no way around that. He says... The real insurrection happened on November 3rd, asshole. January 6th was the protest. I'm sorry. January 6th was the protest. Conspiracies are not conspiracies when they're fucking true. That's like the talking point. That's the thing you say now. They carry it around like a fucking flag at this point. It's not crazy if it's true. It's not crazy if it's true. They repeat it like a mantra. But we're not crazy, right? No, we're so not crazy. There's nothing crazy about saying that Nazis live on Mars. No. Needless to say, Mike Lindell has been very busy and he's been doing his best to spread conspiracy theories like this throughout society for years. Yeah, I would say it's been years now. Absolutely fucking disturbing. Well, guess what? He's paying the price for it now. The dude received a message from his bank saying that they were dropping him because they were worried about reputational damage. They didn't want the government to subpoena them and come in and deal with them and ask them questions about them and all that stuff, and they don't want to be associated with him because he's harmful to their brand, so they're dropping them, which, in my opinion, is their right. However, I have a different take than usual, a different take than you might expect. I will get to it in a second. For the moment, let's watch this clip of Mike Lindell responding to that fact that his bank is dropping him and then I'll give you my opinion on it. This came out mid-January 2022. They want us to leave their bank. They're, you're, what you're going to hear on these recordings are horrific. They Because now that you have, it's manifested from this, Steve. I, I, they're bringing back a year ago and all these terrible outlets like the Washington Post. And uh, I just had a call from The Guardian today. And then you have The Daily Beast. All of these outlets now are attacking me, re-attacking me again trying to say I'm some kind of a, um, let's subpoena Mike Lindell's records. As you know, I went after Pelosi and that big committee they got going to scare everybody. I'm not afraid of their committee. He's talking about the January 6th committee, the people who were investigating what happened on January 6th, who broke into the Capitol and who broke which laws. I'm not afraid of that. I have no fear whatsoever. I don't worry about them knocking my door down and asking me questions. You know why? Because I didn't do anything that violated the law on that day. I was sitting my happy ass at home watching your ass on TV. That's what I was doing. I was watching people bust down doors at the Capitol with zip tie handcuffs 
and gallows erected out back. That's what I was doing. I'm not afraid of what they have to say to me. They have nothing to say because I didn't break any laws. You have no reason to worry about this committee if you didn't violate any laws. They have nothing to say to you otherwise. By doing this, now these banks want to get part of the cancel culture. They want to cancel out all of these entities. The biggest one they worry about, frank speech, everybody. They want to silence frank speech. They want to silence my voice. Lindell TV, there's nine entities on there. Steve, they called me. When they called my controller, I Let's couldn't believe up. it. God, he is obsessed with shouting out frankspeech.tv or whatever the fuck it is, isn't he? This isn't cancel culture. This is a bank protecting their assets, their business. That's what that's what's happening right now. Here's my take on it that differs from what most other leftists would have to say. Political belief is a little bit different than a lot of the other protected classes. For example, race is one of those protected classes. You can't change your race, right? For that reason, political belief isn't protected, but religion is also protected under the Constitution under the, all of those laws. But you can change your religion. But can you actually, can you change your religion? I mean, it's possible. It's not like changing your race, where it, it, it literally is not possible. You are who you are. I don't think religion is something that you can change. You can go through the process of discovering who you are and discovering new information and evaluating that information, all that stuff. But most people are religious in the first place because they were indoctrinated or de facto brainwashed into that position from a young age, mostly. If you join a religion like Jehovah's Witnesses later in life, typically you are already primed to believe that God exists from the start. You already believed to some degree that God was real and he was out there and watching over you for most of your life. That's the case almost all the time, not every time without exception. It's a fundamental piece of people's identity, whether you like that or not, or whether they like that or not. And for that reason, I think religion should be a protected class. You shouldn't be able to, to discriminate against somebody for their religious belief, in my opinion. Well, politics is the same. You can't just change your beliefs on a whim. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and decide, you know what, I am a Republican now. I've just decided to be a Republican, so that's what I am now. It doesn't really work like that. It's a conclusion that I reached, with or without flawed data. I mean, setting aside the data that I use to reach the conclusions that I've reached, it is a conclusion that I've come to. And being at a conclusion like this is not something that can just change with the snap of a finger. There's my argument for protecting political and religious beliefs as one of the protected classes. And if that one doesn't grab you, how about this one? Political belief is actually a protected class under the UN Declaration of Human Rights. This is on the UN website. It says, the United Nations has defined a broad range of internationally accepted rights, including civil, cultural, economic, political, and social rights. It's also established mechanisms to promote and protect these rights and to assist states in carrying out their responsibilities. I don't really view political beliefs as any different from religious beliefs. It's a conclusion that you reached, whether you used flawed data or not to get there. You can't just snap your fingers and change your mind. I think political beliefs should be different. That being said, Mike Lindell isn't being discriminated against for his political beliefs. He's being dropped from his bank for decisions that he made, for things that he actually did that could damage their reputation. That's a completely different situation, in my opinion, and the bank is more than free to drop him. As a matter of fact, they would have been more than free to drop him anyways, legally, I have no real issue with what they're doing either way, whether political belief is a protected class or not. If they started going around dropping every Republican from their bank, I would have a problem with that. I wouldn't want to stand up for that. But that's not what's happening. They're dropping Mike Lindell very specifically because they don't want to risk reputational damage when the feds come in and start subpoenaing records and stuff like that. So this cry of cancel culture is ridiculous. And it's the exact type of thing I've come to expect from somebody like Mike Lindell. If that wasn't enough to turn you off from Mike Lindell and the things that he has to say, 
he actually responded to what people had to say about his mention of 300 million people going to jail a while back. Remember when I played this clip a minute ago? Put everybody in prison for life, 300 and some million people. He made the claim that they have enough evidence to put 300 something million people in prison for life over election fraud. That's what he said. Well, when he was called out on that by the media, by the Washington Post, New York Times, called out for being a foolish thing to say, this is what he had to say to the Washington Post and all of the other, you know, CNN, MSNBC, all of the other media outlets who rightly made fun of him for saying something so ridiculous. Check this out. I don't know if you've seen what the media twists the other day. I said, I said, you know, you guys, we have all the pieces to the puzzle. Let's just take the evidence. We have enough evidence. You could take 300 and some million people, every person in this country, pass it out. And we'd all go to prison for life. That is not what you said, actually. We just listened to it. And as a matter of fact, that isn't what you said. You said we have enough evidence to put 300-something million people away for life. You didn't say, pass it out to everybody in the country. That doesn't even make any sense. What are you talking about? This is honestly like one of the worst defenses he could have gone with. He couldn't have come up with something more creative. I said that the other day, and if you've seen the headlines of the fake news, Mike Lindell wants to put 300 million Americans in prison. If you're just born in the U.S., you're planning on going to prison by Mike Lindell. But you know what? They got the word out there talking about Frank's speech and everything. Oh my god, dude, you're gonna mention Frank's speech again? I think every single clip I've played tonight, he's mentioned Frank's speech TV. If people aren't interested in going to your social media network right now, I don't think they're gonna be interested after hearing you make this shit up. This is absolutely ridiculous. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. This is so fucking sad, but I will be damned if it's not hilarious to watch. Belthazar228, you wonder how Mike Lindell sleeps at night, but then you remember that he's the my pillow guy, right? That's a good point. Uh, sleeps on a pillow, of course. Probably one of his own. You don't think he uses other brands of pillows, do you? Do you think his house is all decked out in my pillow stuff? I bet it is. He seems like the kind of guy that would be obsessed with his own work. Not that he even makes those things, like he has a factory and factory workers to do it for him, but whatever. Next, we're going to talk about televangelist Nathan French prophesying a year ago that God would punish Twitter for kicking Trump off their platform. Give us 30 seconds, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. Next story I wanted to talk about is about a guy named Nathan French. I've talked about this guy before, I think once before, but I want to reintroduce you to him because he's got new stuff that just came out. He's been saying some real weird stuff about Donald Trump specifically for a long, long time. In fact, he was one of the pastors who claims to be a prophet and claimed to have prophesied that Donald Trump was going to win the 2020 election. And of course, when he didn't, it fell flat on his face, and he continued to claim that he was right all along, even though we can see the evidence right in front of our eyes that Biden is the president and not Trump. I wanted to watch this clip from him. November 5th, 2021, he was on the Steve Schultz, Elijah Streams Facebook page, which has about 400,000 followers on it. So let's watch this and see what he had to say about his Trump prophecy a full year after Trump left office. Give it a listen. And the Lord's going to bring Trump back in. Now, Trump, I think President Trump actually uh, would prefer not to have to come back and, and serve uh, in, in the presidency because his life is probably really great not having to take on that responsibility. But I believe that he he knows deep down in his spirit, he knows that God has chosen him, not someone else. He's flawed for sure. I don't believe in some of the things he says about vaccines. But the truth is God called him as the trump card 
and he's right. going to throw that card on the table in just the next few months. He seems to disagree with Trump on a few things, one of which being vaccines. That's interesting, particularly because that's been a sticking point for a lot of evangelicals lately. Greg Locke, one of the die-hardiest Trump supporters alive, turned on Donald Trump over his endorsement of vaccines. I could not believe it when I heard that. You could have knocked me over with a fucking feather when I found out that Greg Locke, of all people, turned on Donald Trump over vaccines. Stop sitting on your butt and waiting for Donald Trump to do something in this nation. He gave the evangelicals a mighty voice, and I'm glad. Whether he runs or not, it's on him, not on me. But I'm sick of Trump worship in this church. If Donald Trump does not get out in front of this vaccine nonsense, he is going to lose his voter base in the next coming election. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. I guess this guy didn't seem to mind it as much. Although at this time, at this time on November 5th, 2021, I don't think that Trump had quite dove in head first into vaccine endorsement. Not quite yet. Uh, he was about to. In the month of December, he went on tour encouraging people to get vaccinated, which good for him, right? Glad that he decided to do that. That's fantastic. There, it's a win-win situation for us. He's going to lose voters and he's going to encourage people to get vaccinated. What could possibly go wrong with that situation? I'm really glad he did that. But it meant that he heavily divided his base of supporters. And I guess this guy ended up on the side of loving Trump anyways. Although the anti-Trump evangelical movement hadn't started full swing yet. It, it's, it was still going to take another month or two before it really started swinging into action. But let's keep listening to Nathan French and see what else he has to say. Table in just the next few months. And you're going to see how God is actually going to take back what the enemy tried to un unauthorize he tried to steal and he tried to manipulate and, and the whole system of how we elect people in the future will be restored. Integrity will come back to the election so process. Good. You know what's weird about this? It's the fact that this guy seems to think that Satan is more powerful than God, right? God told him Trump is going to be president in 2020. He said he's going to win that election. That was God's will, ostensibly. He's telling us, Nathan French, saying to us, it's God's will. He told me he was going to make Trump the president. Now he's telling us that the adversary won because Biden, blah, 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 whatever, with the election. Is Satan more powerful than God? Is that what he's telling us? Is there a possibility that maybe that great war between God and Satan, Armageddon, might go Satan's way? Because that's the impression I'm getting based off of what he's telling us. If that's a possibility, maybe I should get in good with Satan, right? I'm I, Maybe I'm a little worried now. No, I'm not worried. I'm just fucking with you guys. Everybody knows I'm on Satan's payroll. He's been paying me to talk shit about God for five years on YouTube, and it's worked out great. So, yeah, I'm not worried. I know God's going to lose the Great War of Armageddon. Uh, it's, it's fine. Look at what Satan did with uh, Trump, right? God wanted Trump to be president in 2021, and here we are. Satan won, I guess in Nathan French's eyes. Honestly, I shouldn't joke about this stuff because there are people out there like evangelicals that are probably watching this right now and freaking out, actually believe that what I'm saying is true and think that I'm like possessed by demons and that I have some secret communication method with Satan and that he actually does have like a payroll system set up in the United States. I'm 100% sure there really are people out there like that. Are they watching my stream? I don't know. To those people, I do have one question, though. They've already tuned out when they found out I'm on Satan's payroll. I wonder if they believe that Satan pays payroll taxes. Do you think he pays payroll taxes? I'll never get an answer to that question, but I would love to. You know, many people said when I, when I was there at the White House and when President Trump came over and did the fist bump and all the news channels yeah. were, were blazing and taking all the pictures, right? 
And I start, I took a risk to prophesy over him and Melania. What was risky about you doing that? Trump knows that he has like a billion religious followers, although I don't believe for a second that Trump is a religious person himself. And we'll get into that more in a few minutes with this guy's next clip, but I don't believe that for a second. Aside from that, Trump knows he has a ton of religious believers. Why would that be a risk, prophesying over Trump? He'd probably eat that shit up. He'd love it. He would love to know that you are so brainwashed to be his loyal, devoted follower at all costs that you even stand there and pray over him. He would love that. He's probably crazy about the fact that Lance Wallnau has a cardboard cutout of his ass in his house. He'd love that shit. I pray for this man. Lord, I pray you take the smell of smoke, the disappointment, the bitterness, the anger, the feeling of betrayal and loss. That It must be a terrible thing, Lord, to, 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 to actually feel as though you've been stolen in an election and that the nation that you love is, is suffering with it. That wasn't really a risk, man. I'm sorry. I'm not buying it. And I, start, I took a risk to prophesy over him and Melania. But I, I said, you you know, you're going to win big, you know, and he's like, I hope you're right. You know, mm -hmm. I said, oh, yeah. And I repeated it because it was like he wasn't convinced. Right. Because he knew that they had rigged the system because yeah, their, their intel had come in. They knew they were going to try to hijack it. It doesn't matter if they rigged the system. Right. God is all powerful. He can do anything. Snap his fingers. And suddenly Biden is just straight up fucking gone. And Trump is in office. That's how it works. That's how the theology operates, isn't it? That's how I grew up. I mean, that's what I thought. God could just snap his fingers and anything would be done. He snapped his fingers and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Covered the entire earth, supposedly, right? Snapped his fingers and created every living thing on planet earth. Why can't God snap his fingers and suddenly make Trump president? I, I'm, I'm not getting it. The dots are not connecting for me. What's the hang up here? He's all powerful. I'll tell you what the hang up is really. The hang up here is that they have combined two ideologies together. You have Trumpism and you have Christianity. They don't really go together cohesively. They don't fit. It's like two puzzle pieces that you're trying to cram together and failing miserably. It doesn't work because Trump isn't religious. All of the prerequisites that they need that they get from the Bible aren't there. They're not there. Donald Trump has to be like a super devout religious person for this to work, for one thing. He has to like prophesy, he has to ride into Israel on an ass, all that other stuff for him to actually be a messiah. None of it works. It's nonsense from beginning to end, but they ignore the parts that don't work and try to fit him into prophecy in other ways. So what you get when you have two semi-contradicting ideologies and you're trying to smush them together is you get nonsense at the end. You get things that don't really exactly match up. You get holes and logical problems that don't really fit exactly like what you see in this situation. And it is like shooting fish in a barrel to poke holes in this whole story. They were going to try to hijack it. And so I'm I'm standing there in front of him on my birthday. God, he was so excited to be there on his birthday. It was probably a birthday present to go there and meet Trump at a rally or whatever the holy fuck he went to meet him at. That's really sad, man. I feel so bad for this guy that he's so pulled into it. What's happening, what we're seeing right now is the unraveling of the enemy's plan because God's been shining the light. Remember, I gave a word, you know, uh, get right before he shines the light. And I saw the Lord shining mm -hmm. a light into the dark places and all the scurry of the evildoers or those who had had worked against Christ with an antichrist spirit. And so anyway, we're going to see God finish what he began. The word promises that he will finish the good work he began where people miss it and start trying to discredit the prophetic community is when they start getting the timeline messed up. If somebody gives a word that, hey, on this date, this person's going to be in office and it doesn't come to pass, then it was a false word. It wasn't true. But if they give that word and it, the date that they gave hasn't yet come to pass, you can't call them a liar, you know, or that they were wrong because it, the time hasn't happened yet. Okay, interesting. So this guy's explanation for, you know, why all the prophets were wrong about Trump being the president in 2020 or 2021, whatever. He says the reason that they weren't wrong is because everybody actually said 
Trump was going to win a second term. They didn't specify when that second term was going to be. That's that's just bullshit. They did. They said Trump is going to win this election. That's what they said. I mean, I'm quoting Hank Kuhneman. That's what Hank Kuhneman said. As a matter of fact, I can pull up an example. Johnny Enlow said something very, very similar. He basically told his listeners, you don't even need to bother voting. Trump is going to be put in as president by God. This is a rescue operation from heaven. Those were his words. And then on March, right when I'm saying that I have this, oh, it's not an open vision, but it was a vision. And the Lord, it was like, he's like I'm really not interested in your all's vote this time. I'm doing it. I usually give you all that option. This time I'm not. This is a rescue operation from heaven. This is this is a, a, a moment of the ages. This will go down. This time period will go down as a before and after AD, you know, a, a, but BC, AD, the, depending on what terminology you use now. So I get what he's trying to do here, but it's just nonsense. And he's got his facts wrong. Uh, if somebody doesn't give a date and God gives a word and speaks through the voice of his prophets, which he's doing on the earth right now, because he's still, mm-hmm. there's still prophets today. That's This guy really likes to run sentences together. I had to cut it where I could. So uh, you get the idea of what he's saying, though. There's a whole bunch of people on the planet that don't believe that there are still prophets on the earth. And, yeah. and so they, they scripturally are trying to resolve that. And they're teaching people that prophets no longer exist. Oh, this guy would be a nightmare to interview because he doesn't like leave space for you to like move on to the next question. He just kind of runs them together. But anyways, you know, Steve Schultz seems more than happy to just sit here and listen to him talk the entire time. I think we figured out what Nathan French is all about either way. We get the idea. We know what he believes, and we know that it's complete nonsense at this point. It it seems pretty fucking obvious to me that it's nonsense. Dude claimed that Trump was going to get a second term, claimed that Trump was going to win the 2020 election, and here we are. Biden is inaugurated. He's president. And guess what? Biden won the election coming up on a year and a half ago at this point. So that wasn't the first instance of the guy saying all this stuff, though. That one was November 5th when he came out and said that, right? I had covered that clip previously when it first came out, but I haven't covered the other clips of this guy saying similar shit. Let me establish a pattern for you here. This one came out a few months before the last clip we watched. July 29th, 2021 is when this clip came out. Check out what this guy was saying six months after Biden had been inaugurated. Six months after he was inaugurated as president. This guy was saying this shit. And I got to prophesy hope, and I realized that I didn't get that wrong, that he actually did win big. He won really big. And most people, they know that. People especially who hear God and who have explored the evidence know that not only did he win big, but that he is um, still the rightful president, still sitting in that office in the realm of the Spirit. And the Lord said he's going to serve an eviction notice to every plan of the enemy. And so we're going to see literally uh, the shaking of everything that needs to be shaken so that only unshakable things will remain. I just want to establish a pattern here. This guy's been saying the same shit since the beginning. What's even more interesting is when I watch these types of clips, we don't get to hear from Steve Schultz very often, right? This is one of those rare cases where he inserts his opinion into one of these prophets' videos. He happens to consider himself a prophet of God also, as we'll see in a second. Watch this clip of Steve Schultz describing what God showed him about the election. Or remain. And you know what, when he comes back, and this is what the Lord's showing me, and of course that this is probably logical too. This is what the Lord's showing me, and of course this is probably logical too. How absolutely ridiculous. So I guess God is showing him things. This is evidence that he believes himself to be a prophet also. Let's keep listening. When he comes back immediately, because it will be based on an illegal occupation of the White House, by a thief. Sorry, folks, but yeah. he stole the election with the help of foreign governments yes. and wicked people in high places. And the- Wait a minute. Now, when did foreign governments come into this? I don't remember that. When did that even become part of their conspiracy theories? I think I remember something about Sidney Powell saying something like the votes went to Spain or some other nonsense like that. Completely debunked. There was no basis in reality in the first place. But that's like the only instance of anybody mentioning foreign governments. I thought everything was like 
rigged by Joe Biden himself. He's like the puppet master. He's basically Satan incarnate. When did foreign governments get involved in this? Foreign governments yes. and wicked people in high places. And the... This guy is so excited to have his beliefs reaffirmed, isn't he? Look at him on the right. He's like just breathing it in. He's got his eyes closed and everything. Just loves this to death. George Soros is of the year. Sorry about Oh, I think he was blinking. But still, you know, he's so excited. He loves this. Governments yes. and wicked people in high places and the George Soroses of the year. Sorry about that, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Soros. That's right. He stole it. And, and when Trump comes back, even the courts are going to say all of those executive orders, every single one of them, that Biden or the guy with the B on his name, Biden. Is that significant for some reason? The guy with the B in his name, Biden? I've heard a lot of conspiracy theories concocted relating to Biden's name and how you can kind of finagle it around to turn it into the number 666, mostly from Scott Adams, the creator of the Dilbert comics. Uh, as you know, I'm not a believer in um, any kind of religious anything, but I can't help noticing how many satanic coincidences there are with the Joe Biden campaign. What is Joe Biden's uh, slogan? Build back better. Build back better. BBB. If you were going to imagine 666 and you wanted to show it to people and disguise it at the same time, can you think of any letter that the numeral six would fit inside completely? Only capital B. Capital B is the only letter that you could put a six on the inside of it and it would be concealed. But I feel like I'm missing an inside joke here where he says the guy with the B in his name. I, I'm not sure I fully understand. I'm sure it has something to do with some conspiracy theory that he's Satan, though. I'm nearly positive. Farlato, the B in his name thing sounded to me like a reference to Babylon the Great, a la Revelation. That, that's a very strong possibility. In fact, you could be right on that. If somebody else has more information, then mention it in the comments and I'll pin it to the top. You could be very right on that. Babylon the Great is a callback to the Book of Revelation where it, it talks about Babylon the Great being the big evil entity that tries to hurt all the little poor Christians who didn't do anything to anybody. I guess the people in the Bible who wrote the book of Revelation never expected Christians to be the most powerful majority group in the entire country of 330 million people, but I digress once again. Babylon the Great is considered the enemy of Christians, and it's used to refer to the enemy of Christians all the time. I mean, atheists are Babylon the Great to a lot of Christians. Like, anything that's evil is Babylon the Great. Apparently Biden too, most likely. I'm guessing. I'm guessing you're correct about that, Farlato. Or the guy with the B on his name, Biden, enacted are immediately null and void. Boom. They don't have yeah. to be reversed. They never took place. They're null and void. And so um, some of you that says, well, this is hard. He's, he's put so many things into practice, so many things into place. Well, they won't be in place the moment Trump walks in. They will drop to the ground like so much sawdust. They're worthless executive orders. They, don't, they won't have to be applied. They won't have to be reversed. They just, they're null. Amen. Keep living in that fantasy land, man. I, keep writing this fan fiction. It's fascinating. I'll give it a read when you finally publish it. I'm loving it right now. How fucking bizarre is it that this is not a fan fiction? He actually believes this to be fact. That is some strange shit right there. So let's continue establishing this pattern of behavior. I covered a November clip from 2021 where the guy was continuing to say that Trump would get his second term. Then we went back to July, where he was continuing to say Trump won the election, this was all fake, and Biden did this thing and that thing, and he's really Satan and all that shit. Now we're in February 2021. This is nearly immediately after the inauguration. And it's just after Donald Trump got banned from Twitter for inciting violence, I believe. That was January 6th, I think, when Twitter banned him. Maybe the 7th, I don't remember. But it was shortly after that. This clip is about that. Let's listen and see what Nathan French had to say. The Lord said it's this morning, he told me it's unwise to pick a fight with a reigning champion. And God uh, said, he said, Nathan, I'm going to overturn. Reigning champion. 
Is he calling back to all those Trump memes where people like Photoshop Trump's head on like some bodybuilder's body or like a firefighter's body on 9-11 or some other thing like that? Some cringy shit like that. A lot of that stuff comes from the old The Donald subreddit which is now patriots.win, the website. Some of it comes from QAnon, 8chan, places like that. And I apologize, but I'm going to put some up on the side here so you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about. I know they're cringy. Just bear through it. We have to. For the good of the country, we have to look at these memes. Anyways, is that what he's talking about when he says reigning champion? Because as far as I'm concerned, Biden is the reigning champion, right? Because he won the election and he's the president now. Seems to me that God would be talking about Biden if he says don't go up against a reigning champion. That seems logical, right? Overturn, and I'm going to reinstate Trump. And so I realized that not only has God chosen President Trump and Melania, but but when you mess with God's plan, then you come against God himself and you pick a fight with God. And so why doesn't God just snap his fucking fingers? I don't understand. Why doesn't God snap his fingers and put Trump in? This is making no sense to me at all. God could snap his fingers and create life in a fraction of a second. Why can't he snap his fingers and make Trump the president again instantly? The fight with God. And so I saw big tech companies. He, actually, this is what the Lord said to me this morning. He said big tech companies will begin to crumble if they continue to come against God's anointed. Right there it is. Once again, this is the perceived future justice being served moment. He seems to believe that at some point in the future, justice will be served or what he believes justice would be. In this case, he seems to believe that justice would be Twitter being erased from existence because they refuse to allow Trump to incite violence on their servers. A private company making private company decisions for themselves, and he seems to absolutely hate that so much that he wants to see God erase it from history, and believes that he will. They claim to hold all of these values, free market capitalism, let the markets decide, so on and so forth, up until they don't. This is a another example of two ideologies clashing. They hold one ideology, but the moment it's contradicted by another, they fold. They call it quits. They suddenly don't believe in that ideology anymore at all. They suddenly believe in the more important one which in this case is Donald Trump. So they don't believe in free market capitalism all of a sudden because they believe in Donald Trump more. Principles be damned. Consistency be damned. Doesn't matter. What matters is hurting your enemy. What matters is winning. They don't even know the meaning of the word hypocrisy. It doesn't matter to them. What matters is owning the libs and nothing else. Check out this next clip. This is June 7th, 2021, and it should tell you exactly how he views Donald Trump, how he feels about Trump. Check this out. And I know this is what's happening with President Trump. He's moving into a time of, of great intimacy personally. Before, it was like he was taking other people's words word for it like what what's god showing you and he, he was receiving prayer enjoying the charismatics you know uh but still with some uh, some um need to go deeper and and now i see president trump in the spirit like literally coming to the lord and asking him questions wow. and okay so what he's claiming now this is actually a pretty extraordinary claim he seems to be claiming that he can astral project that is something that a lot of QAnoners believe and this guy i think does qualify as a QAnoner. mark taylor actually talked about astral projecting too where they can basically rise themselves up out of their bodies and enter a non-physical plane cat kerr believes this shit too and they can see people coming and approaching god and praying to him and stuff so what he's about to describe to us is what he claims to have witnessed Donald Trump doing. He claims he saw Donald Trump approach God in the spirit realm. Keep listening. Questions wow. and hearing God for himself and not so much needing to rely on everybody else's opinion, but actually hearing God, knowing he heard God. It comes through credible sources where, uh, you know, they're confirming what God is speaking to him directly. So I saw Trump 
in, in the spirit and his ear, his ear was small. And then I saw him listening for God and the, the opening of his ear literally started to grow, representing his increased capacity to be able to hear and be directed by the voice of God. It gets stranger and stranger with this guy. I haven't covered him very often. Maybe I should cover him more because he is something else. His beliefs are so fucking weird. This next clip came from mid-January 2022. It's the latest one I've got, and I wanted to give it a watch. Check this shit out. And I feel like God showed me, he said, you know, the truth is that Trump is the real president. And and no matter what they propagate, he's coming back. And I, and I wasn't sure if he was just going to enjoy himself and then come back at some time in the future. But I can see how God is orchestrating for him to come back uh, sooner than what people think. And so I'm excited. I mean, I know he won uh, with a landslide victory. I prophesied that over over him. Um, sooner than what people think? He believes Trump is coming back sooner than what people think? Well, people thought that it was going to be January 20th. It would have had to have been before January 20th of 2021 for it to be sooner than people think. It is no longer sooner than people think. That is no longer a valid thing to say about this situation. I'm excited. I mean, I know he won uh, with a landslide victory. I prophesied that over over him um, on my birthday at the White House. I said, you're going to win big. He's like, I hope you're right, you know, because he knew they were going to try to steal it. This honestly seems like the biggest moment in this guy's life. The fact that he spent his birthday at the White House prophesying to Donald Trump. That honestly breaks my heart. Really, that breaks my heart that this guy is so completely brainwashed by this movement. At this point, in my opinion, there's no saving him. He's gone. His mind belongs to Donald Trump. Mid-January 2022 is when this came out, a year after Joe Biden was inaugurated. And this guy is still telling this story about meeting Trump on his birthday and prophesying that God told him Trump was going to win, and he still, to this day, believes that prophecy. Is this guy ever going to give it up? No. I really don't believe he ever will. And neither will the people at his church. He is a televangelist. He's the leader of a pretty big church. He's not a nobody, or I wouldn't be covering him probably. He has influence, and he still believes this so deeply to the bottom of his heart. That is heartbreaking. Next, we're going to talk about Pastor Tommy McMurtry's problem with feminism and gay people. Give us 30 seconds, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. Next story I wanted to talk about is about a guy named Tommy McMurtry. It's been a while since I've talked about him, but let me give you a little bit of background on who he is. A couple years ago, the atheist YouTube community participated in something called the Pumpkin Saga. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Basically, this guy, Tommy McMurtry, decided to hold an event with members of his church and members of his organization. It was called Make America Straight Again. It was a vehemently anti-gay rally, for lack of a better term, I guess. They were holding an anti-gay convention, maybe? I guess convention would be the right word. They ended up having to hold the convention at one of their churches in Florida, I believe, because they were kicked out of every venue that they tried to hold it in. There's a reason that they held it in Florida, though, and there's a reason why they held it on the specific date that they did. Do you guys remember the Pulse nightclub? There was this terrible event that took place there a few years ago. Uh, June 12th, 2016 is when this happened in Pulse nightclub. It was an anti-gay situation that unfolded. A really, really ugly situation. Well, the NIFB, which is the organization that Tommy McMurtry is a part of, they decided to hold their Make America Straight Again conference on the anniversary 
of the Pulse nightclub events in Florida, which is where this happened, where the Pulse nightclub thing took place. Needless to say, they are truly depraved, evil individuals. NIFB stands for New Independent Fundamentalist Baptists. I believe it was started by Steven Anderson. I've talked about him a few times. Anyways, he's one of Steven Anderson's generals, for lack of a better term. He's the leader of one of the churches in the NIFB. I haven't covered him in a while, but I wanted to cover him again because he's been saying some real weird shit lately. But before we talk about his latest clips, Let's take a look at this old video, June 2019, right in the middle of the pumpkin saga, when he was about to hold the Make America Straight Again conference. He decided to come out on record, tell us his thoughts about the LGBT community. We know there have always been, we know they have always been around. We've read the book of Genesis, okay? Nobody's saying they're never around, but there was a time when society, when our country saw them for what they were and they put them in their place six feet under. And unfortunately, we have forgotten that in our country. I just want to make sure everybody knows where he stands on this issue. He wants to make sure you understand where he stands on this issue too or he wouldn't have put this video out. He got a lot of bad press coverage for this, but he doubled and even tripled down. He didn't make a mistake when he said this. He knew what he was saying, and he said it deliberately. That's how he feels. This one is from late February 2021. This is one of his newer clips I wanted to watch. Check this one out. In this one, he's talking about bigger pastors from his broader movement, um, televangelists like Hank Kuhneman and others like that. Listen to this. All these preachers, they thought I was going to be one of these hipster skinny jean types. But yeah, at the same time, here we are, you know, I'm one of the poster people that are against them. Yeah. You know, and where are all of you? Right. You know, where's all these big names? They'll, the big names will go and they'll take little digs here and there at the big conferences to get a bunch of amens out mm. of the people in the pews. So they consider themselves underdogs, I guess. They're kind of talking trash about the big names like Hank Kuhneman and Kenneth Copeland and others like that. Keep listening. It gets worse. Yeah, and you know what? I'm just gonna it, you know just say this right here too. Okay, I'm not stupid. All right, I'm very socially aware. There's a lot of old IFBers that enjoy me going at the trendies. I don't know what a trendy is. I tried to look this up, tried to figure it out. I assume it's is that like the new version of libtard cuckflake? I assume that's what he's talking about when he says trendy. I don't I don't know. They cheer me on going after the trendies. But at the same time, they throw me under the bus in a heartbeat. An I, I am an expendable. We've had this discussion before. Yep. This is like his persecution complex coming out on full display. It's like a prerequisite to be in this belief system. You have to feel like you're persecuted. You have to display to everybody around you that you're persecuted. But once again, it gets worse than this. Keep listening. They are the Jews. We are the lewd fellows of the baser side. That's right. It's weird how they keep comparing their enemies to Jews, right? This isn't the only instance of it. Why do they keep comparing their enemies to Jews? It's that kind of thing that makes me think people are anti-Semitic, okay? You don't have to come out and say, I don't like Jews, for me to think you're anti-Semitic. It's just fucking strange when you come out here and keep comparing people that you don't like to Jews. What the fuck is going on here? Why do you keep doing this shit? It's just weird. They have people that <laughs> they don't like. And they're laughing because they know that reference is going to catch people's attention. They have stirred us up and have sent them after them. And if we get burned, they're still in the clear. Yeah. Well, that's that, Tommy. He's 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 an extremist. He's, he's a, a wacko. wacko. Yeah, he's a wacko. Yeah. You know, he's he's too mean to the homos. <laughs> He's wrong on eschatology, yeah. you know, so yeah, I, I, fo I listen, I'm not stupid, folks. Yeah. If there's any appearance of anybody from the IFB uh, liking me, it's just, I'm an expendable, <laughs> I'm doing their dirty work for them. I'm not stupid, okay? <laughs> fellas the base uh, and you know what? That's fine. Uh, I, my feelings aren't hurt, but I get it. It's so funny, too. Nathan Cravat, every time somebody's like starts like agreeing with me whenever there's some kind of argument going on, he immediately gets on. Did you know Tommy says, you know, 
homophobic slurs. I won't say it. I don't want to get a strike right now. You literally just said it. This is so fucking sad, man. This guy is obsessed with two things. Persecution complex. I'm sorry, three things. Persecution complex, blaming the Jews for things, or at least accusing people of being like Jews, and using slurs. Those are his top three favorite things of all time. It's so fucking sad. There's like nothing else in his life that has any meaning. Check out this next clip. This is late January 2022. He had some interesting things to say about feminism. You know what, ladies, if you don't feel like you're getting this sometimes, you know what, maybe it's the feminist movement, you know, this mess of guys, and maybe that's what killed chivalry. And so, you know, you know, we need more ladies standing up against the Ellen DeGenerates and the harpies on the view and people like that. You know, you need to stand up against that. You need to harpies on the view. I've never heard that before in my life. You know, um, honestly, I shouldn't repeat words that he says that I don't know because they are actually very likely slurs. I don't actually know what that is in reality. Um, and another thing, why is this guy obsessed with using slurs in all seriousness? This is like his favorite fucking thing to do. From my understanding, a lot of pastors have an aversion to using strong language. They don't like to use the fuck word or the shit word or any of those other words generally. They don't go around throwing throwing those things around, right? Why do they throw those words around? Why do they throw slurs around? I don't understand. These are words that I don't say because they're fucking disgusting to me to say things like that, to boil somebody down into a single characteristic, a single stereotype about themselves. For some reason, that just goes right over these people's heads. The more extreme the pastor that I cover, the more likely they are to use slurs. I don't get it. I don't get why they are so obsessed with it. Oh, and that last point isn't lost on me either. His obsession with feminism and blaming everything on it. First it was the Jews and now it's feminism. I guess we know where his priorities lie. The Ellen DeGenerates and the harpies on the view and people like that. You know, you need to stand up against that. You need to speak out against the Beth Moores and uh, what's the lady that looks like Joker? Uh, Joyce Meyer, right? I don't know who he's talking about right now, but whatever. You know, you need, you need to stand up against people like that, too, because they're ruining things for you. Guys are listening to what they're saying, and then you know what they're doing? They're starting to treat you like men. This is like incel ideology 101. I do want to point something out, though. Uh, we've been listening to a pretty extreme guy this whole time, Tommy McMurtry. He's famous for being extreme, but... Tony's spell is a little bit more mainstream. I wanted to talk about a recent clip from him too, mid-January 2022, just to make a point that homophobia is still firmly rooted in the church. Tommy McMurtry is not an outlier. This is still incredibly common, and it's something that we have to work on. Listen to this clip from Tony Spell, mid-January 2022. There ought to be anger that rises up in us whenever the Secretary of Transportation who is the forerunner to be the president of the United States. In oh, hold on now. G give me just a second here. He's talking about Pete Buttigieg. He is not a forerunner to be president of the United States. What is he talking about? Is he even in the presidential chain of whatever? Like if the president dies and the vice president becomes, what's that called? Chain of succession, that's it. Is he even in the chain of succession? I think he may be, but he's pretty far down on the list. I got the impression Tony Spell was kind of saying that he is like next in line, like he's a favorite to run for president. That's not the impression I got. I thought it was going to be Kamala Harris next if Biden doesn't run. I get the impression that Biden and Harris are both going to run. I know that this is a small point to nitpick, but... I have to pull apart everything this guy says because there's misinformation and little facts that aren't quite right scattered all through everything the dude says. I don't want to let him get away with anything. To be the president of the United States in 2024 for the Democratic Party came off of a two-month maternal leave. Uh, no, he came off of a two-month paternity leave paternity leave that's where the dad gets to take time off to spend time with the kid is this like really such a hard concept to grasp two month maternal leave it was not a woman but it was a man that is married to a man there ought to be anger inside of everybody here today why 
Why ought there be anger in everybody today? Why did this guy stand up when he started talking about this? Because this is a mainstream idea. Homophobia and hatred like this is mainstream in the Christian community still, in the evangelical community. This is a problem that still needs to be resolved. We've made large strides. We've made a lot of progress. This battle is not over. It's not just the extremists like Tommy McMurtry. They're not the only ones doing this. He's one of the few that use slurs regularly. I really don't think that's terribly common, although it happens. But he's not the only one preaching the message. Tony Spell is more mainstream. We have to find a way to deal with the homophobia in the church. It is not going away until we address it. Thank you guys for coming and giving this a listen, and I will talk to you next week. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and stickers and stuff on there. Second, you can support me by checking out my Etsy store. I sell 3D printed stands for every system from the original Nintendo to the Xbox One. And finally, if you want to support me in other ways, you can check me out on my other channels. I have the podcast channel, which is where I talk about whatever's on my mind. Politics, social issues, Issues, whatever. You can also find it everywhere podcasts can be found. Or you can check out the videos on my main channel where I focus on destructive cults. As it is with most channels these days, I rely on the support of viewers like you to keep my channel alive, so sharing my work is extremely helpful. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.